Okay, we will uh, resume with agenda item 7C, Commission General Regulation 492, Thermal Imaging Optics, Chief Game Warden Mike Maynard for possible action. The Commission will hold a workshop to consider a regulation to consider amending Nevada Administrative Code 503 and NAC 503.1485 relating to wildlife prohibiting the use of certain night vision equipment and devices for locating hunting and taking game mammals and game birds, revising the definition of trail camera or similar device and providing other matters mm -hmm. properly relating thereto. Chief Game Warden Maynard. Good morning, everybody. I think it is, yes. Okay. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commission. Uh, I'm here to present the uh, What's the number on that one? It's a regulation involving LCB file number R035-20 um, related to night vision equipment. So real quickly, um, we did a, a search, just, just a little of the history on this before we get into it, which might help some understanding. This was an internal, uh, internally generated uh, regulation in our department given some of the issues with fair chase um, and the one definition that we looked at was fair chase is the ethical sportsmanlike and lawful pursuit in any taking of free ranging wild native North American big game animal in a manner that does not give the hunter an improper advantage over such animals so in that process we looked at several states and what their laws were including Arizona Washington California Idaho Utah and Montana um, and we can refer back to those as needed. Um, basically, from the, the white paper I sent out, the, the first section of this regulation addresses an addition to NAC Chapter 503 concerning John. what equipment or devices may be used or possessed while locating, hunting, or taking any bird, game bird, or game mammal. This section also addresses exceptions for certain sites attached to a firearm bow or crossbow. Um, the second yeah. section addresses Okay. amending NAC 503-1485-3 okay. to clean up language and regulate usage no, no, no. of devices Just that have a time lapsing okay. record function yes. for uh, trail cameras. Uh, our recommendation is to adopt the language as is, uh, these additions and changes to Chapter 503 and NAC 503-1485 address potential ethical concerns of fair chase related to constantly evolving technology. The Commission would so desire I can read through the changes or the proposed language? Yes. I, I don't think we need to read through it. I mean, I've been through it. I'm confident that the other commissioners have as well. I'll stand for any questions. Any questions for Chief Game Warden, Commissioner Hubs, and then Commissioner East? Um, yes, the only questions... Okay, so obviously, one of my points was what about non-game wildlife? I always feel like they're overlooked. So we're saying any any species of wildlife that's non-game um, is subject to these type of weapons being used on them at any time, correct? The, the answer is it depends. Basically, this regulation simply addresses uh, in NRS 501-110, NAC 503-020 and NAC 503-045 uh, game mammals and game birds it, and those are just the only two main categories it addresses it doesn't address the others depending on what category the other species not mentioned fall into they may or may not have this uh, have a protection which forbids certain methods of hunting Right, because if it's a fair chase issue, then I, I personally feel that it should apply to every species of wildlife. Like, if they're, if they're too advanced for wildlife to really put up a good fair chase in any means, I don't understand why we're just looking at game species versus non-game. I think that would be cruel, um, especially with some of the weaponry designated under this code. And then my only other question is, there are exemptions for um, the limitations on the use of site attached to a firearm, bow, or crossbow that is powered by a battery contained within the site 
is illuminated by light gathering fiber optics or uses a radioactive isotope such as titanium. Is that tritium? Or is that supposed to be titanium? Tritium? It's supposed to be tritium, yeah. Um, so is that a typo or is that tritium? I believe that's how the compound is spelled. Okay. Um, so what are those used for and why are those exempted? That's my only question. Um, Chief Game Warden Mike Maynard, for the record, basically that's a verbatim uh, recitation of NAC 503-145 that already exists. It's just putting that language in there to uh, make sure that it, this regulation d is not confused with limiting that regulation which already covers that portion. And those are common mechanisms that are used for game species right now? The ones listed under Section 2? Yes. Um, it, it depends on the person. Uh, some, some people use them, some don't. Thank you. Um, so, Commissioner Hubbs asked one of my questions, but the other is, have we had any issues with this? It doesn't sound like we have, but I'm just trying to clarify where this may be coming from. So just to... Well, actually, we, we have had issues. They're yeah. not, they don't necessarily hit the public eye, but we've had uh, numerous inquiries from the public over the last several years asking uh, if it's okay if they take um, a scope with a thermal sight on it, on a you know thermal night vision scope, into the field to scout for animals at three in the morning so they can wait for hunting light. Um, and we've told them, well, no. But that that has come up numerous times where people, the technology, the big issue that's driving this, this isn't like a big event happened and, and it drove this direction it's that technology is, is gradually getting more and more uh, available to the hunting public I mean night vision optics 20 years ago were in the thousands of dollars for the, the cheapest version potentially um, and now you can get uh, a, a thermal scope with video capability for under 5,000 so there's there's a lot of and I, and I could go into the, in, the individual types of technology they're all different in what they do and how they work um, but it, it's increasingly available in a lot of formats a lot of this stuff was military only for years and now it's starting to find its way as typically happens after several years into the, the public domain um, and the by nature of this equipment it would be extremely difficult to to be proactive in the sense of well they're allowed to carry it so we have to wait until they offend you know this gives them the capability of literally hunting in complete darkness Thank you. any question additional questions uh, go ahead and take it out to public comment Rex Flowers, for the record. Um, I'm really against the first part of this doing with the thermal imaging. Um, they say in here it's to address potential ethical concerns of fair chase. Once again, ethics are not regulated, they're taught. And we need to keep that in mind. We, keep, we can't keep regulating everything we do. Um, I, I think this is a bad play, a bad way to go. I think that law enforcement needs to spend more time enforcing laws and not trying to legislate and regulate. Um, I also would like to bring up when when we start down this road that we're going to now start after thermal imaging. I worry from a whole whole different perspective. Uh, if, we're going to start attack, attacking items that you can put on your weaponry. Will that weaponry down the road be attacked by the antis and those that 
don't want gun ownership. I mean, it, it, to you it may sound like it's out of the park, uh, but remember, suppressors used to be legal. They're not part of a gun or a weapon, but they're illegal now. Well, that happened with this. Down the road, will somebody take advantage of this to create another thing that says, you, can't, you do not have the right to own this. So, uh, but my biggest point is, we don't right now have a uh, situation. This is potential, uh, as what it says within the department's own uh, recommendation, and it's attack ethics. And, and I think, again, look at your own selves, your own families. Ethics is what you create and what you've learned uh, in the past. It's not something that's been regulated on to you. Thank you. For the record, Paul Dixon Clark. Um, we supported uh, in a unanimous decision this regulation, um, potential regulation going forward. But we had several recommendations because we felt the language, the wording language was unclear. Um, I don't need to read um, section 1 1, but we, we felt rewording section 1 1, and I won't read it in the record, but it is part of my action report. In section 1 1 A to 1 1 E, uh, the cab really wanted to know if there was a legal definition of thermal imaging devices that could be referenced in that section and whether or not there were some examples that could be given or, or alluded to somewhere so that people had an idea what it was. And then finally in section 2A, 2B, and 2C, we talk about things that are currently can be on a scope and really what these things are is they enhance the shooter's ability to use their weaponry but they don't enhance the shooter's ability to see downfield. And that's very unclear the way that the regulation is drafted right now. And clarifying that to say, if you have um, a tritium front sight, it doesn't help you shoot an animal downfield, but it helps you better aim at that animal. If you have archery and you have fiber optics, it's so that you can illuminate and see your, your distance pins better, but it doesn't allow you to shoot better downfield. That's, and, and that isn't really clear when you look at that regulation. So or wording, at least it wasn't to the cab or myself. So, thank you. As Steve Robinson, Washoe. Um, as Washoe Cab, we unanimously, unanimously rejected um, this proposal for the thermal imaging. Uh, we feel that this is, this technology, although it can be misused, is a very useful tool to view, view wildlife and also hunt predators at night. Our concern was you're on a deer hunt and you also choose to do some nighttime predator hunting, um, you would be in violation of the law and um, have some stiff penalties. Uh, with some experience with thermal imagers, as soon as it approaches legal hunting light, it's pretty useless. And so, you know, if you want to be at three o'clock in the morning looking for a deer, it's one thing, but during legal uh, hunting hours, it's not very useful. And we're also concerned about, you know, this, um, we're trying to become the most restrictive and regulated state in the West and we, we're against that also, so thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion. Commissioner Valentine. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, um, 30 years back, I had the opportunity to use some night vision scope, I guess you could call it. 30 years ago, technology was not very advanced, but I did a little bit of scouting. Obviously, ethically, when you're looking at an alfalfa field at 2 in the morning, and then in bed, and then up the next morning, the deer that you're using the scope on is not usually in the vicinity at that time. I'm concerned about a regulation that if we don't have any issues that enforcement is, is dealing with currently, why, why do we need the regulation at this time if it's not being abused? I don't know if Chief Game Warden Maynard wants to address that question.
Chief Game Warden Mike Maynard for the record. Um, the to, to address your first point, part of the reason why this even came up was we had a we were getting calls from the public by people who wanted and were actively seeking to use this technology in the field. Um, have, do we have any current open cases involving this that I can think of? No. Um, however, the the case that the individual on the phone gave me was he wanted to be able to sit on a hill with a thermal scope, which can see through brush and highlight where an animal is, that wouldn't necessarily be visible to the naked eye, and certainly not in total darkness. And he could sit there and watch it as long as he wanted. And then when legal hunting light came, he could take a shot. So there, there is potential for abuse. And granted, yes, it is a potential. Do I know of any factual cases where this has occurred? No. It's The technology is pretty advanced, though. It's There are some systems now that give you very, very good clarity at distance, close up, behind shrubbery, what have you. Um, we have thermal sites that we use, uh, they're handheld, and they do have a function. We use them to locate people that are floating in the water. Um, so there, there's a lot of technology out there and it's growing every day and it's getting better and better every day. And the capability is really impressive when you use some of it. So it's, it's, it's of course up to the commission to decide how they, they choose to view this, but I, it, it strains credibility to think that there's somebody who's going to go coyote hunting um, at 3 a.m. on opening day with this thermal night vision and he's, he's only out there in case he sees a coyote and not for the deer. Mr. Chairman, if, if I might just try to add some department perspective and um, maybe where, what some of our thoughts are on some of this technology and what we call technology creep. Um, you know, we, we see, you know, a continual creep in, uh, we talk about these loopholes, we talk about this demand exceeding the supply, we talk about apps that people will use to gain access to uh, information of, on tags. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, personal aircraft, um, the commission and the state has taken a stance on uh, whether or not you know paraplanes should be used to scout animals or, or run animals. The commission took uh, some proactive steps in addressing smart uh, weapon and tracking technology where a, a gun um, could identify a target from up to a mile away, lock into that target and shoot a target moving up to 35 miles per hour from a great distance away. Um, what we're talking about is is ethics and to the question of, of You know why address it now if it's not a problem? There's a significant investment that individuals make whether it's a paraplane whether it's uh, trail cameras whether it's smart weaponry um, to you know where Chief Maynard talked about $5,000 for some of this imagery. If individuals purchase this imagery, invest in this imagery, not only is it a little disingenuous to, to then, after the fact, uh, pull the rug out from under them when we know we've had inquiries about its legality, um, but it's also much harder to have that discussion after it becomes established or more socially acceptable. And so I, I know we've, we've heard uh, concerns from the public and cabs uh, about you know being uh, you know regulating things uh, about being the most uh, heavily regulated state in in the West. Um, I think from the department's perspective, um, I think we could say that we're one of the most ethical states uh, in the West and proactively addressing a technology creep that won't be good for the future of hunting. It won't be be viewed favorably by the growing uh, mass of, of critics that are taking shots. And so if we're not uh, able or willing to proactively address technology creep um, before it's a problem, um, then I fear we're gonna pay a bigger price um, down the road. And I think the commission has had a very similar view uh, with respect to smart triggers, smart weaponry, 
uh, trail cams, paraplanes. Otherwise, I, I don't believe those actions would, would have been taken. So that, that's kind of where the department is on it. We see, um, again, just another technology. Um, we want to be the ones who are setting uh, the standards for ourselves um, because I don't think we're going to like it when uh, the legislature or others uh, tell us what, what they want us to do. Commissioner Hubs? I just was thinking as um, we had Secretary Wesley speaking and, you know, it's, it's ironic to me that we will regulate sportsmen because they will have fraudulent con conduct with their bonus points and all of that. But we're not going to regulate ethics in this capacity for wildlife when that's what our job is here to do is to hold wildlife and you know it's for public trust to preserve wildlife and i i think that we have to focus in on what is our goal and our mission on this commission is to protect wildlife not just game wildlife non-game wildlife it's all wildlife for the state of nevada if we think these things violate fair chase and that's what's putting being put, brought forward by the, the department, I think we question that. Is that a true statement? Do we believe that? And if so, it should really apply to all wildlife. There's not one species that's more valued than another. And if, if fair chase is the issue, I really don't feel like it should just pertain to game animals. I mean, do we want to see birds or small mammals or whatever taken out by these types of um, technology as well and if so why why are they less important to me that's a, that's a big question and um, we're, we just got through with a regulation where it passed because we want to regulate ethics people lie that's what we're saying people gain the system we need to regulate this but now oh no now we're not going to regulate this because we can't regulate ethics in this situation when it comes to the very wildlife we're here to protect and hold in trust for the public. So that's my comment, and I just want to put it out there. Thank you, Commissioner Hubbs. Any additional comments? Commissioner Keel? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'm generally fine with the language in here, but I do take exception to the, the, a person shall not possess while they're in the field. You know, if there's a large hunting party and, you know, some guys do want to go out and hunt coyotes while other people are hunting deer, um, I think that's fine. Um, I know that probably interjects the gray area into the law enforcement side of that uh, and makes your job tougher, but um, I think that's kind of my stuff. Um, Commissioner Hubbs? Yeah, additional comments? I, I personally wasn't surprised to see this regulation get proposed um, and I think Director Wasley stole a little bit of my thunder which he likes to do um, and I, uh, people said well we, we have addressed very similar issues in the past um, when we talked about the smart rifles and said that's just technology that we don't want people to use when, when hunting in the state of Nevada, that's we're going to draw a line there. And so when this was presented, I wasn't surprised. Uh, I know more and more technology that used to be in the exclusive possession of the military is becoming more and more available to everybody else. I was probably more surprised to hear objections to it. And uh, I feel that if we don't, as a commission, five of whom represent sportsmen don't take steps to proactively place limits on what we think is acceptable weaponry and technology to be used then we will ultimately face changes in mandates from others if we don't police ourselves then someone else is going to do it for us and we may not like what that becomes uh, I thought the language was okay I, I do understand that the possess or use, and it seems to me that it should be a use, not just mere possession. I understand the enforcement issues, but um, I just didn't 
this just didn't rub me the wrong way that it did others and I don't know what I'm missing uh, maybe I'm not missing anything maybe I just disagree with those that are opposed Mr. Valentine Vice Chair East. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm caught in the middle, I guess. I, you know, I hear what everybody's saying, and I, I understand what the department's doing, and I, I, too, feel like if we don't do something, we're going to be mandated to do something by the legislature, and we only have a few months until that comes up. And so I, um, I would just caution us in that regard we can we can either write our own regulation or we're going to have to write it the way they want it in a couple of months um and i'll say this too in the last three years of being on this commission i feel like and i've been saying this for a while we yes we're here to to conserve wildlife but we are here to regulate ethics and i feel like that's that's kind of, in summary, what we've been doing since I've been on this commission. So. Chief Game Warden Maynard, I, I also have a question. You mentioned other states in the West. What have the other states done? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe the Arizona regulation um, they uh, say not, shall not use or possess electronic night vision, electronically enhanced light gathering devices, thermal imaging devices, or laser sights projecting a visible light. Um, Washington regulation uh, addresses uh, prohibited using night vision and laser sighting um, and other thermal imaging devices. California uh, restricts uh, any infrared or similar light used in conjunction with an electronic viewing device. Montana restricts uh, projecting of artificial light and illuminating a target with infrared light visible only with specialized optics to illuminate the target. Idaho, um, they have uh, regulations on use of thermal imaging and uh, night vision. They can't use thermal imaging or night vision to hunt or pursue big game. Um, Utah's regulation basically they adjusted they hope to address that through hunting hours uh, that's that's kind of a, a brief synopsis of what their regulations are we based a lot of this you know on similar language that, that worked for them just just to touch on a few points for from an enforcement perspective um, we, we do regulate ethics because ethics are shown through behavior and we regulate behavior all the time that's what laws are I mean and an attorney could probably tell me, but it is not a misdemeanor bad behavior by definition. Um, so there's, there's, there's always going to be challenges to that, and we're not blind to that. Again, as Director Wazi said, there's a huge technology sweep in uh, all sorts of advances with night vision and thermal imaging and things that assist people with shooting weaponry. Um, the some of the language specifically for law enforcement if they can carry it but it's only illegal if they use it I, I it would to be quite to be quite honest that language would make the law basically unenforceable or the regulation I mean you would have to literally sit right there and watch them actually hold it up to their eye to say that they were using it otherwise and, and what are the odds of that happening in darkness unless we're literally on top of them at the time 
So the, the reality is, is that it needs to be user possessed. And that the argument was made, um, all the arguments that were brought up were addressed. I've heard every year I've worked as a game warden out doing deer patrol, I'm hunting coyotes. That's why I'm carrying a seven millimeter Remington Magnum with a 12 power scope with my buddy who has a tag, but I don't. He'll shoot the deer and I shoot any coyotes that pop up before he sees a deer. I'm not saying that that's not a possibility. It does strain my credibility vibe just a little bit. Um, the, those arguments were brought up by the people that came and or that called me personally that I talked to that were arguing to carry thermal stuff. Well, what if my friend carries a rifle with thermal optics on there? What if I just carry it and I use it for scouting but not for hunting? And there, there's a whole bunch of what ifs and, and, and attempts to find a, a loophole basically. So at the end of the day, can we prevent somebody whose friend is 100 feet away with thermal vision um, spotting deer for them? The, the likelihood is, is always going to be there, okay? But the, the reality is, is that it's for an ethical hunter to be able to sit there with a scope on his rifle, a thermal scope, if the language was changed to where it's only if it's used, he could literally put that scope on there the entire time and unscrew it right before he took the shot and say, well, I wasn't using it. It was just on my rifle. And it's like, okay, I guess that's the case. So that, that's just my perspective from enforcing the law on being cautious of the loopholes that we may inadvertently build in Obviously, this isn't going to be a draconian enforcement effort. It's going to be difficult. Um, it does limit the, the scope that we're going to have to look at, no pun intended, for people if we see somebody with a military grade thermal optic on their hunting rifle when it's an hour before sunset and they have a deer tag and everybody else has deer tags, it gives us a little bit of room to have a discussion with them. Thank you. Commissioner Hubs. On that note, I just want to reiterate once again that I think that it should really be looked at in terms of non-game species, if that is a loophole. Um, because if, if this is truly a fair chase policy, again, I don't see why we wouldn't examine non-game species. It's just going to create a loophole as well. And if it's really not an issue, I mean, we're talking military grade type equipment out and with our wildlife. To me, non-game is just as important as game. Um, all wildlife is important. So if we're going to take a stance, I don't understand why we would even create a so-called loophole for a coyote or whatever um, with hunters. You, you will inevitably, if that's what you're hearing, that's what you're going to see. So I don't see why the application can't be broader in nature to all wildlife. Through, through you, Mr. Chairman, to uh, uh, the the thermal imagery stuff has already been used in in hunting coyotes. It's since since this stuff hit the shelves, it's been out in the marketplace. It's not a, that's not a what if, that's a reality. Any other comments? Commissioner Cavillia? Um, I, I guess like you, I, I fully expected this to be coming before the commission at some point with the technology. Um, I've heard, I've, I haven't seen it personally, but I've heard grumblings like the thermal imaging stuff's getting really good now. And I've, I've heard a guy's already starting to utilize that, especially in southeastern Nevada for the deer hunts where it's beyond competitive. Um, and I, tr I truly don't believe it's fair chase either, you know, and, and it's just human nature. You give the guys opportunity to use that stuff, they're going to use it. And it, it is getting really good now. Um, so I, I personally don't have an issue with the proposed regulation. I'll just offer one comment, just a personal story. We, my family, unfortunately, lost one of our dogs got loose about the first of the year. 
and I went and I, I never owned a trail cam but I went and got some that then put the picture to my phone and set them up to see where the dog had been spotted could we get a picture of the dog in real time well unfortunately we didn't get any pictures of the dog but we also got a lot of trail cameras destroyed people broke off the transmitting antenna uh, muddied up the lens or just broke them all together which I find ironic that someone walks up to one there's a picture of them and then they destroy it but the reason I bring that up is you see how the public reacts. They immediately seeing something was nefarious going on where it actually was very something very innocent. We were trying to locate one of our dogs and he's still gone. I'm hoping someone found him and he's got a good home somewhere. I worry if we were to say no to this, what does that say about us as a commission? Have at it. Take every piece of technology you want. Let's go back then and, and rescind the smart rifle uh, red. Let's have the smart triggers with the smart coops. Now with thermal imaging on top of it, what does that say about us? It tends, it tends to me to feed into the criticism that sometimes, in my opinion, is very unwarranted that is lobbed to us. But if we weren't to say, yes, there is a limit and we're going to take a proactive step, and to send that message that this where this commission stands. If we don't do that, what is the converse message that we're sending? So I, I support it. Um, I support it as written, and that's where I would. It's where I stand. Commissioner Allenberg. Yeah, I fully support it. I I mean I understand that everybody feels overwhelmed with regulation, but I, there's. And I feel at times hypocritical, you know, uh, we've accepted some technology, we have accepted better scopes, better binoculars, all this other stuff, and so I feel a little bit hypocritical, but there's, there's limits, you know, and that, that's, I guess, part of the, the, the lack of understanding of why we would do this, but for me, I mean, it's, it's beyond, it's, it's uh, I, I don't have any issue with, with uh, saying this, when is enough is enough, and this technology is, is just like the smart scopes. It's just beyond for me. Um, so I, I, have, I have no problem supporting, supporting this. It, 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 it kind of reminds me of something like, if you have to call the game warden and say, hey, can I do this? You ought to be questioned. Why are you imposing that question? I, I mean, seriously, you're like, hmm, I'm really on the line. And it's kind of like, you know, if you have to ask the question, you probably already have the answer to the question itself. It's just like the ethical obligations that I have in my profession. If I have to go look it up, I probably already know the answer because something may not be right. And it seems to me that uh, you, you put these in place for a variety of reasons, but I often think that people who feel overwhelmed by regulation are the ones that need to be regulated. Those that don't feel overwhelmed by regulation are those that do the right thing, irrespective of what the regulations are. And so, um, I'm supportive of this. I don't know. I, 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 I think I would. Um, I'm gonna. I think we should take formal action. That way, we can get the vote on the record, given the public comment, and that rather than just um, pass it on. So, if, unless there's further comments or discussions. I, I would make a motion that that we move Commission General Regulation 492 LCB file number R035-20 to an adoption hearing as presented. Is everyone clear on the motion? Yes, Commissioner Hubbs? I obviously support it as written. Um, obviously, if I had my way, I would want to broaden the regulation, but um, I am very pleased that our sportsmen are on board and we have our commission on board to protect our wildlife in regard to the technology presented today and obviously we'll support the regulation as presented. Any other further comments? I'll call for the vote then. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 9-0.
with that, we'll close agenda item seven and move on to agenda item eight, mandatory indoctrination seminar for Bighorn Ram tag holders, game division administrator Mike Scott for possible action. Game division administrator Mike Scott will provide a presentation on mandatory indoctrination slash seminar for Bighorn Ram tag holders. The commission may take action to require big Ram tag holders to complete an indoctrination class slash seminar. Mr. Scott. Chairman Johnston, uh, members of the commission, Mike Scott for the record. Um, staff specialist uh, Mike Cox provided me with a, about a 30 page PowerPoint presentation. Um, I Only 30? To, I will try to go through and hit the highlights of it and uh, uh, then I'll answer any questions that you have. Um, 1952 was the first uh, official bighorn sheep season in Nevada. Uh, at that time, we had a three-quarter curl uh, horn harvest requirement. And uh, it's kind of ironic that hunters were required to carry a 15-power spotting scope. And I would say that I have several rifles that have higher-powered rifle scopes on them now. So uh, moving on, um, in 1966, the, the requirement changed from three-quarter curl to have a, a 144 Boone and Crockett score with the largest side doubled, which was called the Nevada score at that time, or be a minimum of seven years of age. And also uh, hunters, first time sheep hunters were required to attend a bighorn indoctrination. Um, the purpose of the indoctrination in those years was basically to show people what a, what a trophy ram was or a, an older age class ram. Um, in, in 1986, several of the central Nevada mountain ranges, the regulation changed from to a any ram uh, regulation just because of the size of the, the rams were a little bit smaller in some of those some of those units. In 1994, um, the uh, the bulk of the state went to an any ram regulation, with the exception of Lincoln County and Clark County. Uh, they remained with the seven-year 144 uh, requirements. In 1996, the entire state went to a, an any ram regulation. Uh, in 1997, the bighorn indoctrination was no longer required if you attended the class after 1990. Um, guides who attended the class after 1997 never had to attend the class again. And there was a, in place, the, the Nevada Department of Wildlife director could excuse an applicant from attending the indoctrination. Uh, that remained in place for, for a period of time until 2012. And in, in that year, the change was made so that the Bighorn indoctrination was no longer mandatory, which is where it stands today. Um, and also the, the indoctrination was changed to seminar in 2015. So. We no longer call it the indoctrination. Uh, the past mandatory seminar process required us to send out letters to successful applicants, schedule venues for the, these events, uh, updating the presentations each year, coordinating with various sportsmen's groups to uh, make sure that they were involved. Um, we had a sign-up sheet that required every, every uh, applicant every attendee to sign um, and we provided their their tags at that time once they showed their driver's license um, we also at that time there was letters of guide designation that were filled out by guides for that were attending for their clients uh, the purpose of the bighorn seminar there's there's kind of five five things that that we we still view as the purpose uh, to teach hunters how to field judge, age, and score of rams to reduce the chances that they would harvest a younger ram. Uh, to educate and inform hunters about bighorn sheep management and restoration efforts. To increase awareness of diseases and pathogen trans transmission and the impact that that has on bighorn herds. 
uh, to communicate the various rule and regulations unique to different public lands around Nevada and to provide information about field, field care and cape care of harvested animals. Uh, the current situation is that we hold three bighorn seminars around the state, one in Reno, one in Elko, and one in Las Vegas. Last year, a total of 75 people attended in Reno, 27 in Elko, and 14 in Las Vegas. Uh, the number of tags that were issued last year was 368. That does not include the specialty tags. Uh, currently, game biologists handle the, the bulk of this, the, the indoctrination or seminar classes, but the whole process has more or less outgrown the game division, and uh, we would like to have a lot more help from the, the Con Ed division, which we've, we've discussed with, and, and they're willing to help. They have a lot more expertise in these events than we do. Um, and currently, we also have mandatory online seminars for both Bighorn Ewes and Mountain Goats. Uh, we also currently still have a mandatory bear indoctrination, which has always been in person. I'm not sure what the status of that is going to be this year. Um, our recommendation for the, the 2020 Bighorn Seminar will be to conduct a, a single Zoom webinar in August with a condensed presentation. Um, generally, this class took close to eight hours, uh, about six hours of, of classroom, and then we would have a, a, an outdoor practical where we had mannequins and sheep skulls that we could adjust and change and allow hunters to bring their own optics and sit and, and look at different ages of sheep, different sizes, and, and different horn conformations. Um, what we would like to do this year is to reduce the amount of time that that class takes uh, mail and email invites to all RAM tag holders and try to accommodate the field horn aging and scoring by providing photos in a PowerPoint presentation for everybody. Going forward, what the game division would recommend is to move to make RAM tag holders take a condensed mandatory class that would require about two and a half hours with the following options. We would like to have uh, people attend an in-class in-person class if possible. We would provide that class as a, a Zoom webinar so they could watch it online. And we would provide that class as a pre-recorded class that they could watch online at in any other time at their convenience. So that's what the game division would like to see, but um, I'll, we'll answer any questions. Any questions? Commissioner Valentine? Thank you, Chairman Johnston. Is this on? Yeah. Mr. Scott, um, would the classes be tied to the issuance of the tags? Or could it possibly be tied to the issuance of the tags? So that it, it could be. Um, that That's that would be up to you. Um, it's no longer, it's not required now, but it did used to be where they, we actually issued them the tags at the end of the class. The reason I bring that up is, is when I took my indoctrination class back in 2006, there were a couple of tags that were not distributed. And if those tags could get back into the system early enough that we could get those tags issued, I, mean, I think that would behoove the department and uh, and help help with uh, ensuring that there's people that take advantage of those tags. Additional questions, Commissioner Hubbs. <laughs> I just wanted to um, ask a question in regard to the bighorn sheep and their biology. Like, what is the overall purpose and goal of the training, and what are we trying to get the hunters to do um, with this class? Is this just about understanding the age and size of a bighorn sheep from a hunter's perspective, or is there something that we're saying as a department, like, 
we want you to hone in on these types of rams and this is important to their biology in some manner. Thank you for the question, Commissioner Hobbs. Uh, Mike Scott, for the record. Initially, I think the, the indoctrination was provided to allow hunters to uh, be able to harvest uh, an older age class, uh, older age class ram. In, in other words, um, we wanted them to be able to identify the, the different horn conformations or things like that. From, from a game division standpoint now, I would prefer that we hold this class mandatory simply because of the disease issues that we're faced with across the state. Um, we would love to know, or at least get the, the message across to tag holders that if they see animals coughing, if they see a domestic sheep, a domestic goat in the area that they're hunting, we want to be able to educate them that that's important. Um, with regard to the, 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 the trophy part of this, um, it's it's a, any ram and it that part of it is less important to the game division than than getting the message across for the disease issues the other thing that that is important is uh to make sure especially for some of the the tags that are uh, california sheep or or uh, rocky mountain is meat care and it's a lot warmer at the time that they're hunting and we would like to make sure that they're aware that there's there's uh, 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 an urgency to get their meat cooled down, their, make sure their cape is, is taken care of, and so they end up with with better meat to, to consume, as well as having a, a better looking mount for for the, the wall, I guess. Vice Chair East. Thank you. Um, hey, Mike. Are there classes for other big game species? I remember going to a class years ago, I think when I got an antelope tag. Are there other classes? And not none of those are mandatory if there are, right? Commissioner East, uh, Mike Scott for the record. Yeah, we currently have uh, antelope indoctrination or antelope seminars. I think we have one in Reno and one in Las Vegas that are very well attended. And that's kind of the reason why I, I say we would like Con Ed to, to help us with this because they do a, an excellent job in, in the outreach and getting people to come to their events. And, you know, with 14 people coming to the Las Vegas Bighorn indoctrination, that's, that's not enough, especially in Las Vegas. Um, we also do uh, the bear indoctrination. That's required. And we also have uh, classes for both online classes for both um, bighorn ewes and mountain goats that are required. Okay. And I'm assuming cost isn't a factor in this. Is there, what's for you all, right? Not, not, that's really not a consideration. We, we can do this relatively inexpensively. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Hubs. Ever since I have been on the commission, the concern about the microplasma, is that microplasma, or micro, mycoplasma, pardon me, um, has been discussed with our bighorn sheep, and it's not getting any better. Um, there's no solution coming in the future, and although our sportsmen out in the field, obviously they're going to be, bring back anecdotal information as to what they see. I think more eyes on the ground is important right now. So even if they're out hunting and they see sheep acting in a manner that we can train them, might exhibit that this is an infected population or a population that's suffering, even if we can get it back to the state, I think that's extremely helpful. And if the concern wasn't one in which we constantly talk about having no resolution for. I don't see how we could pass up an opportunity, and I think most sportsmen will want to report back on that if they know why they're doing it. I think it's really important for us to know, and sometimes anecdotal information leads us to new discoveries and different populations that might be suffering or those that might not be. And I think it would be a really good thing to do for our sheep population right now, in my opinion. Commissioner Cavilla. Um, 
I, I don't see a downside to it at all. I mean, I think it's I think it's beneficial overall. I, I see no downside to it. I, I guess, Mike, I'm curious with the U tags now and the GO tags, the class is mandatory. Are we holding those tags until they take the class online, or is it just a, you got to do it if you fill your tag and we go check? Um, and you haven't taken it, you can get in trouble. Do you know what we're doing with those? I'm just curious. Commissioner Cavillia, Mike Scott for the record. I'm sorry, I don't know if we hold the tags back until they they take the class. That I believe it's done through Calcomy, but I might refer to Jack on, on this one. Mr. Allenberg? Yeah, I think that there's a ton of positive things that can come out of making it mandatory. Uh, you know, and, and it's part of the indoctrination is is more specific. Uh, recognition of symptoms of the of the disease would be extremely uh, uh, beneficial. Um, we, there's part of the sportsman's role is when they're out in the field is to report what they see as abnormal abnormalities. I mean, and so the, the better trained they are, uh, you know, it's all it's all good for me. I really like it. I'm all for this. I'll support it. Um, anytime we can do public education and outreach is really important to me. So I'm I would support this. Mr. Hubs. Just one more question on this, because obviously I support it. I just um, spoke about that, but are we still going to be calling it the indoctrination program, or are we not going to be calling it the indoctrination? Indoctrination is just a bit odd. It's like, hi, you know, when you think about our history and indoctrination programs, it just kind of has a bad it might like the marketing or um, I, I'm just thinking from how you want to hear it. No one, nobody wants to be indoctrinated, you know, they would like to learn, I'm sure. But so I just wanted to go over that for one last. Uh, Commissioner Hubs, Mike Scott, for the record. Um, uh, former chief of game, Brian Wakeling felt the same way and he changed the name in 2015. He didn't like the, the, the term indoctrination and we changed it to seminar at that point. So I got to give him credit for that. Okay, this is a action item. So why don't we take it out to public comment for any public comment? Let, Mr. Perrier, let's just wait to the mic so we can hear. NBU, we call, actually I called Mike Cox about the taking of too many uh, ram lambs in the U hunt. Did the indoctrination make a difference or the training or schooling or whatever they want to call it? Did it make, because they were t harvesting a push in 20% some years of ram lambs when it was a U hunt. And everything else about this program I think is great because you, you ask questions about population dynamics during scouting and the hunt, how many lambs, how many ewes, how many rams, and basic age. So I think the program I would support, but did it make a difference in the ewe hunt? Let's get through the public comment and then perhaps you can answer the questions then. Rob Jacobson, Lyon County Cab. We discuss this, uh, some, and we are 100% support it. Sometimes those that uh, think they need the least help need the most. Um, and then we thought that uh, if we get the, because they do a great job of the post hunt survey, if you'd actually issue that post survey with the tag, they would probably track better data, um, just knowing the questions going in. Everybody. 
Rob Beamer, Carson City Cab. Um, our our um, team uh, discussed this as well. <clears throat> um, we were 100% in favor of it. Um, one question that we had was very similar to Commissioner Valentine. We felt like if we're going to make it a mandatory thing, then maybe as a checks and balances, right, to to uh, have the tag issued at the actual training or after the training, um, we felt like that was kind of a good checks and balance that, you know, the department doesn't have to waste all their resources and double checking that, uh, that sort of thing. So I'll leave that. Paul Dixon, Clark Cab. Uh, what I will say is that we had unanimous support for the concept, but when we took the vote because of the motion, I ended up 5-2. And the two dissenting opinions, one of them had to do with the fact of a point already brought up is that the indoctrination class should not only clever rams, but ewes. Because of the fact that we have a ewe hunt and you can misidentify yearling rams as ewes, you want to make sure that um, people understand when they shoot a ewe, they're actually shooting a ewe. Um, the other thing was is that one of the people on our, on our board felt really strongly that having this as an online class, he knows of two people that sat in Hawaii surfing while their wives logged into the class and watched it on the beach. So um, point being is that he felt in person was invaluable, at least for ram hunters, being able to touch and feel. If you're going to have a class, you have to make it, if it's going to be online, that really gives that touch and feel for age classing. I mean, that's the valuable invaluable nature of, of a, in, in person is that being able to touch and feel when you're trying to age class a ram. And if you're going to have something online, you really have to have something that mimics that in person thing we follow. Thank you. Any additional public comment? <clears throat> 